Welcome to Signal, the podcast that raises your frequency. I'm Maury Fontanez. And I'm Melissa Grushka. And today we're going to talk about resilience and what makes us strong. Bean, you hmm. feeling strong? Some days. Well, hello uh, there, friend. Hi, buddy. Hi. hi. Uh, how's I how's if it that's going? Annoying. I wonder if the way we do that all the time is annoying to people. Hi. hi. Bye. It's annoying to me. Oh. Forget others. <laughs> I'm annoying. I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Uh, I'm pretty good. Life I is love clear. this. Chilling. Yeah. I know. I, this is a good vibe I've got going here. I, you really do. It and I'm feeling week. it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, all I want is for your happiness. That's so kind of you. And your resilience and strength to be wow. top notch. Top notch. Well, what's going on this week, Bean? Anything happen in your life that was of interest? I. Whenever you ask me this, are you asking about my week or do you want me to cringe delight immediately? Or you just like want to talk about the week? No, it's my what's... way of asking about your cringe delight. Is this for oh, real? Okay. I, I honestly, I get tripped up every week when we do it. I'm like, you, know what? you can feel my week? free to tell me about your week. How about that? Just tell me. I don't your want week to. Went. I guarantee that there was something cringy or delightful. I don't want to, but I do have a really good delight. Okay. Um, it may not be delightful to others, but I am a child of the eighties and nineties. And I grew up watching TGIF, which included full house. TGIF. And Wait. I have, yeah. Full house. TGIF. It was Family full house. Matters. Something and then Perfect Strangers, or it was Perfect, Perfect Strangers and then just the ten of us, or was that later? Just the ten of us. Do you remember Damn, that one? That's a deep recall. Yeah, mm, that might not Damn have been in the re- dinosaurs. Wait. Dinosaurs was on for a minute. Later. Later. It was part of the TGIF lineup. Are you, you looking it up right now? Hell yes. Oh shit! It didn't even Why really have to do with the <laughs> TGIF. Why not? I feel like anyone in the, from the 80s 90s. and 90s right now is like they're waiting dying. with bated breath. Like, what was it? Full house. Okay. Um, going not places? The mom. No, thank you. Going places? I don't even that know. That may what. have been the OG. All right, skip it because no one knows. Okay. Um, so we have Perfect Strangers, Family no. Matters, and yeah. Full House. Then we're joined by Going Places, a comedy centering on the lives of four roommates. No way. I don't no remember way. that. And that was the wrong order. I remember Perfect Strangers was on at nine. I think you're right. Yeah, I think Full House was first. No, look. Oh, you're right. Look, in, on September 22nd of 1990, the lineup was Perfect Strangers, Family Matters, Full House, and Just the Ten of Us. Just the Ten of Us. What year was yeah. that? 1989. Oh, snap. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was Just so you guys know, TGIF was a two-hour block of family-friendly comedies that tried to make it seem fun staying in on Friday nights. <laughs> but it was a different time. It kind of was. It was when we were younger and we were kids. And like, even if your parents went out, you would watch TGIF. Yeah, and totally. And it was different. I, it was. Yeah. It really did make it like you all sat around the TV together. A hundred percent. All around right. the TV together. Um, America's Funniest Home Videos. No, Wonder Years. Oh, what the best would you show. Do if I say out of tune. We haven't sung Which together in a while. Really <laughs> um, okay, and sorry. it hit different. I'm sorry, but it, let's just say it hit different then because it, there was no streaming. There was no fast forwarding through commercials. It was like you got what you got when you got it, and that yeah. was it. You'd run to the bathroom during a commercial break run back in time to make it before it came back from the commercial break well anyway. hold on Do you know yeah. the, okay wait what was the other block of comedies that had a name that you watched in the 90s come on saturday morning cartoons no must see tv oh what was must see tv are you was kidding that abc me? wait when we were younger nbc no now i'm talking 90s that was like friends yeah yeah no i'm talking childhood can we go further back please yeah must but the see must see tv, TV lineup was will and grace Bell, friends yeah. er will and oh, grace i didn't watch er er that's oh i didn't really God. watch it oh really i <gasps> thought that i was gonna marry george clooney at that point in my life you did i was sure i was like one day he'll see me this is like 15 year old me with frizzy hair and he won't be able to like resist Keep, and we'll be I married. I feel like that's still true if he saw you. Okay. Have you seen his wife? Let's have him on the podcast sure. to see if there's Let's chemistry. 
Let's reach George out. George Clooney, your people reach out to our people so and our, our people, people is me. Is us. <laughs> <laughs> so just have your people reach out to me. Anyway, this is a very, this was tangent. very tangential. Yeah, yeah. The point of it was Full House holds a very dear, near and dear place in my yes, heart. And I've been asking my kids to watch it with me. I will say my sister and I were consistently compared to DJ and Stephanie Tanner because yes. we always got along and my sister was always looking out for me and I yes. danced just like Stephanie danced. She was a little spunkier. I was a little spunkier. It just really was. Like, what? There were a lot of parallels oh between, between me and mean? I danced just like Stephanie Tanner. Stephanie what does was, that mean? She went to dance. She was like a big dancer. Remember, they would have episodes with her at her yeah. dance recitals when she did Motown Phillies back. <laughs> remember? Do you want me to and do you, And you were like I, that? That was your inspiration? Stephanie Tanner? No, I, oh. I was a dancer. I took tap, ba- yeah, tap yeah, ballet yeah. and jazz like forever. And okay. I was spunky like Stephanie Tanner. And my sister was calmer and sweet like DJ. Anyway, there were a lot of parallels. We were consistently told we were like those sisters, which was nothing short of an mm. honor, to be honest. Anyway, sure. I've been wanting to watch it for a long time. <laughs> And nobody's wanted to do. And then finally, my middle one was like, I'm ready. And I was like, oh, are you? Of course, Layla was the one. She's the G-man. won't even stay in the room. Yeah. And we've been watching it and it is so goddamn fun. And what does she think about it? She really likes it. Well, she has said that she goes back and forth. I think it's like a little hokey and it doesn't totally translate. But Remy, my youngest, is like, loves it. I'm sure. Like loves so lighthearted. it. I also think it's like the lighthearted energy that comes off of shows like that just feels really good. But there's like a real, there's always a nice message. And the whole totally. thing behind it is there's like so much love in that house, which I Did you really ever want to get with Uncle Jesse? Did you ever I fantasize? Mean, I about still want to get with Uncle Jesse. I do too. But I also feel like I had weird feelings about Uncle Jesse as like a 13 year old. Why? I don't know. Why? Because he's a grown man and I was fantasizing. Oh, mm, I, that was me from early on, and I never took oh, right. you the fact. I never had issues with the fact that that was me. <laughs> you were a little more promiscuous. <laughs> I was like, oh, hubba hub. What did he used to say to Aunt Becky? Oh, have, have mercy. No, have, have mercy. mercy. Oh, yes. We God, should just that. do an episode about 80s TV because honestly, it's been like 20 minutes and we've been talking about You this. realize that that was one of our first ideas oh. when we making this show. We were like, 80s TV and the producers Golden were like, girls. what? Yeah. Why <laughs> would we do that? Not only that, I really love that this is an episode about resilience and all we've done is talk about TGIF. I think this is a good actually tool <laughs> of resilience. I will... I promise I'll bring it back around. You never struggle. Anyway, my delight is watching that. And that made me think it is really delightful. Can I also ask what the appropriate, I really, really, really want to watch Dirty Dancing with my girls. What did Um, you think I was going to say? 90210. No, I I feel like that's like junk. And no offense, loved it. But like, I don't want my kids to watch that. Dirty Dancing holds such a special place in my heart. Like yeah. beyond, beyond. You could watch that with them now. I was, I was I Layla's age when I watched Dirty Dancing. Oh, I was young, way younger than that. Yeah. But we watched crazy shit when we were little. Again, it was the eighties. We watched crazy. I grew up watching Beetlejuice and Labyrinth, which is some of the darkest stuff there is. No, honey, it was it's a different time. They're living that shit right now. Are you I kidding? Like- we were watching that stuff. They're like living in a dumpster fire. It's okay. <laughs> it's all good. I don't know. I yeah, think like there's a lot of like dance. sex and judgment about people having money and not having money. I don't know. They live in that world. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I'm not we'll ready, but I am online. very much excited for the day when I can watch Dirty Dancing with my children. Great. I feel like CPS is coming for me. Yeah, totally. <laughs> very excited for the day to watch Dirty Dancing with my children. <laughs> All right. Just give me your cringe and delight. Let's no, I got, you show. know, it's so funny. <gasps> My what? delight is very parallel to your delight. How amazing is that? Okay. Really so, amazing. I had the most epic um, overnight to LA with my baby girl who's yeah. 15. Not a baby girl. We had the yeah. best time together. The, we went to see Leve in concert, which is, she's amazing. I don't know okay. who that Did is. Did I talk about this already? No, I but know. I don't know who that is. Um, she's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Leve, Leve, spell- and she's it's spelled L A U F E Y because she's Icelandic. Um, Leve. but she played with the L A Philharmonic behind her. Oh, she is freaking little. rad! Yeah, it was really good, and and I just had such respect for my daughter. 
for being the one to introduce me to this artist who sounds like Billie Holiday. Like, uh-uh. really amazing. Yeah. Anyway, Raina's the best so time, cool. I was like, you're so cool. You're the best. I just can't believe you're my daughter. Like, I really felt like I just got to engage with her and, like, be present. Anyway, she oh is going to kill me for telling the story, but none of her friends <gasps> listen to this podcast, so we're okay. Um, oh, TJ's calling. TJ, it is podcast recording time. <laughs> um, so... She afterwards, like, mom, I really want to tell you the lore of this anime that I'm watching so that we can watch the next epi- the next season together. Anime has a lot of lore. Like, it has a lot of side stories and this and that. Does? Like, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know nothing so, about anime. It is not my scene. But if yeah. Raina thinks it's cool, then so do I. Right. Now it's cool. <laughs> so we go back to the hotel and she is, and I'm thinking in my head, okay, focus focus this is going to be a lot of detail how oh, in the no. hell are you right yeah is your brain gonna ever with its adhd like okay good luck but like it matters yeah. to her so try yeah so we're in we're, speed. we're laying there and she's got she's you know telling me this lore and 15 minutes have gone by and the thought occurs to me after 15 minutes wow i really understand every single detail of this story like oh, good i know who's dating who i know the family that this one came from i know that like so then I stop and I'm like, why do I understand this? And I, it's almost like I come into the room, like I come into reality and I notice that this child has her laptop and that every time she says the name of a character, she has a tab with their picture open on it and she's showing me their picture. Every and single person? Every character, she'll click to a different face. Different Did face she too. have like a presentation set up, ready to roll? Like she opened her, you know, Google Chrome and just looked up images of each of these characters and had a different tab with wow. their faces. And wow. I was like, Raina, are you showing me the picture of every character as you're describing it? She goes, yeah, mom. And I was like, why? And she goes, that's how your brain takes in information. I just wanted you to understand. <gasps> what? <gasps> I was like... Holy shit, if anyone had ever known this about me, I would have been fucking, I would have gone to Harvard on a scholarship for sure. How does she know that? And I said, would you, like, is this something you would do? And she goes, no, mom, I'm doing this for you because this is how you, this is how you'll understand it. I didn't even know this about you, I feel like. I wouldn't have been able to come up with that. Can you believe that? How attuned is she? Oh, I fucking love that girl. I and I thought, you know too. what? I am doing everything to get to know you, but you're also doing everything to get to know me. <laughs> That's right? so beautiful. Kupaya. The most beautiful. All right. Oh, wow. Well, I think we're done. Let's just end this episode here. Wow. It's been that, like I feel resilient now. Do you? This no, so that beautiful. was unrelated. But yes, that is so beautiful. That trumped my, I don't even want to use that word anymore. No, that, don't for, please don't use that word. But also, there is, we're not playing a comparison game. Okay, fine. But my story but that win. was really meaningful. We're not playing a comparison game, but I won. I won. <laughs> Mine was better. Well, Bean, listen, before we talk about, listen, today we really wanted to talk about resilience and what makes us strong because um, today is 9-11 when this episode comes out. And I think always on this day, those of us that are American think about resilience and what um this country had to go through and how actually now there are multiple nations around the world that are having to practice resilience just to survive um but yeah. also then as we like to do really make it individualistic like what does resilience actually look like in yeah. each of our individual lives i think that we are being asked to be deeply resilient at this moment in time And so we thought we'd take a moment and shine a light on resilience. So before we do that, we just want um, as many people as possible to be helped by this work that we do and this episode specifically. So if you listen to this episode and you feel um, uplifted by it or enlightened by it, we just ask that you please share this with one or two people that you care about so that we can do this work um, and share these kinds of self-growth messages with more and more people that would mean a lot to us so anyway resilience beanie why do we want to do this episode i'm just gonna dive right in please do i think that um we are 
in a moment in history where things are overwhelming, both externally and in terms of the level of self-awareness we are each um, achieving about ourselves and our pasts and our traumas and how they hold us back. And so it feels like a really overwhelming time to be alive for a lot of people. I hear that Me a included. lot. Yeah, for Bean especially. But also, I hear that a lot from um, Gen Z. I think that, you know, oh, wow. they're going to change the world, as is Gen Alpha. But I think they're going to change it by being really overwhelmed by what it is that they live in. And so I thought, you know, we need to take a moment and talk about, like, how can we establish resilience, personal, individual, and collective resilience? So that not only do we survive complicated times, but that we thrive, that we come out the other yeah. end. And we grow. More, yeah, more expanded, more fulfilled, yeah. more purposeful than ever before. So that's why I wanted to do this episode. And we're going to talk about resilience, both through a personal and a spiritual concept, because in my way of seeing the world, you know, there is so much spiritual value and there's so many gems for our soul in this act of resilience. And so I want to bring it back to that. Wow. Um, anyway, so that's my view on it. What What's your view on why? I'm pretty much the same. Right now? Yeah. Pretty much the same thing as yours, except my outlook is much grimmer than yours. So I'm hoping that this episode is enlightening. Um, I just think that po the political landscape right now is like unlike anything we've ever seen. The world feels like it's in a state of complete disarray constantly. It's like we're always waiting for the next terrible piece of news to come in. I think COVID was one of the big things that really shifted our entire ways of life and understanding society as we once knew it. Um, and I think that we are constantly up against a lot of challenges. Um, so I think that this is a really critical time to be mindful of resilience as a society and as an individual. Um, I myself am having a lot of trouble with this upcoming election in November. Um, I'm not really sure how to be more resilient. I feel overwhelmed by it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Like, I think that the, it's not so much about the politics. It's about how much hatefulness we are getting exposed to Yeah, and how much awareness we have about how separate we are in our ways of thinking yes. and being and living and like how we have just forgotten that we are a collective species. Like we are at each other's throats. Constantly. Um, Myself included. Yeah. In a way that is so harmful Yeah, and sort of makes you lose hope. It's and created so much the division. Other end yeah. of the spectrum of resilience. Yeah. So I think that it's really important that we, put this in the frame of hope because I, I think, think that's what we're losing. Yeah. I think hope is, is sort of part of the path of resilience more than the yeah. other end. Like it's a critical element of being resilient yeah. is maintaining yeah, some right. level of hope. Agreed. Um, yeah. Anyway. So you think that Gen Z and Gen Alpha, Gen Alpha is after Gen Z. Is that what yeah. that is? Are going to save us because they are feeling the weight of this, and I'm always concerned that they're just going to collapse under the weight of this because it's no so way. heavy. You have to believe Great. more in them. Well, maybe to. we should learn they're more about amazing. resilience. Yeah, I'm not saying they're, they're amazing. not amazing. I'm saying that the world is in the craziest moment in time that it seems like not who? actually, not actually oh. the craziest moment. In time. It feels like it could be just crushing to entire yeah. generations. No judgment. I get it. I don't know if we could handle it ourselves. But we humans are resilient. We are. Like, this we is why I love history. This is why. Because what I'm most fascinated by is when the shit really hit the fan. How in the hell did we not only make our way out of it, but did we expand and evolve our consciousness through it? And if you look through the last 2,000 years, we as a species have been through some shit. Like, it has not been an easy evolution for us no we have evolved quickly technology has expanded quickly very quickly but prior to so much of that like life was hard and there was famine and war and religious war and you know like we have been Disease. through yeah yeah so 
I just really want to underscore underscore this episode by saying the thing I know about us is that we are resilient. That is why we have survived. We are resilient motherfuckers. So I'm going to flip my mentality then. Yeah, absolutely. And each generation is even more resilient than the last. Oh, I really believe the opposite. That's so funny. I feel the opposite. I feel like we are getting away from resilience almost as a society. Like we're moving further. Why do you feel that way? Why do you feel like Gen Z, for example, is less resilient? Mm, I I feel like this is going to be controversial and I know I'm not going to say it in the correct way, but we've even spoken to this on previous episodes about even Gen Z in the workplace, although maybe it's actually about resilience. I was going to say like they are looking to shift. They don't want to work like we work. You know what I mean? But to me, I keep seeing that as like what, I mean, you don't have to work like we work. I agree with the boundaries, but I feel like a lot of Gen Z has gone the other direction Uh and not met somewhere in the middle because of a lack of resilience. I I don't want to say that because Gen Z is going to come for me. No, they're not. I think you have to swing the pendulum to balance things out. And I think that that's what that generation is doing. They are swinging the pendulum all the way to the other side to be like, why? Why is this like this? Okay. Why should I sacrifice Fair. my well-being for your productivity? You right. Why should I be getting paid less for you to make more? What is the purpose of this? Like, yes, ask those questions. I get what you're saying. You know, I coach so many CEOs and companies. Yeah. I understand that right now there is a challenge around motivating this generation right. to be engaged and solutions oriented at work. Like that is something that we keep seeing, which is like, well, that's just not my job. It's like, well, I need you to do a little more and care a little more, but you got to get them excited and inspired and you have to get them to want to engage. It is a two way street. I think that we come us millennials from a generation where you just did it. It didn't matter like whether you were inspired to do it or not. So Mm -hmm. hell yeah. It's an act of resilience and resistance to be like, it ain't going to be the way it was. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be better so that we can not only survive, but thrive. And for the record, I agree with them. Like, I do not think that the way of our way of life is sustainable. I think there has to be some more balance. I just think that they've gone that, like you said, the opposite end and there has to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But perhaps it is a resilience, like the pushback and getting getting that type of negative feedback from your higher ups and still pushing back is resilience in its own way totally and which leads me to my next point resilience really uh is able to shine in the face of adversity so i'm just going to take a quick moment and define adversity which is a state or instance of serious or continued difficulty or misfortune we all know adversity we all know we've all faced adversity there's all kinds of adversity there's emotional adversity which is um can count people who have trouble processing emotions, or if you're rejected, there's a million kinds. I mean, I'd say for me, emotional adversity is probably my top, top struggle. Anyway, um, there's mental adversity, like learning disabilities, issues with memory. I don't know what that's like, but that is, I would imagine that feels pretty challenging having a bad memory. Um, physical adversity. Also challenging to be best friends with someone who has a bad memory. That's <laughs> oh, an sorry. adversity that I think you is need underrepresented. To be, you need to be a little more resilient, okay? I need a support group. Um, physical adversity, like illnesses, disabilities, injuries, social adversity, trouble making friends, dealing with bullies. Yeah. Um, financial adversity, which is a big, big guy. Um, poverty, loss of a job, trouble in your career. So yeah. there's, luckily for us, there's Absolutely. adversity abundance. everywhere. Abundance of adversity. There's, ab- there's adversity abundance, everyone. So you pick your poison, please. <laughs> you know what I always like, um, what I always get about adversity when I meditate and I plug in and I like, you know, receive guidance. Yeah. I always hear this like, um, you wanted to grow, right? Yeah. That's it. Okay. So here's how you grow. Like that's it. That's it. So like it. for example, um you want to be your higher self, right? Yeah. Okay. So let me show you through adversity how you are your higher self. Let me show you your pathway to higher self 
by presenting you with adversity so that you can understand the magnificence of who you are and what you're capable of. And you can grow into that expanded version of yourself. Ain't no growing into the expanded version of yourself safe and comfy and warm and, you know, like unchallenged totally all the time. That's hard to hear when you're suffering. It really is hard it to is. hear when you're suffering. And I've had times where things have been so hard where I'm like, fuck that. Like, just make it easier for five minutes. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Does it have Give to be a, all this adversity all at yeah. once? Um, but then looking back on those times and looking at myself today and realizing, oh my God, you'd never be this person ever, ever, ever had you not gone through those really, really difficult times. So I just want to say that about adversity. But yes, I agree that we have an abundance of adversity available to us to pick from and grow we through. We sure do. Can I ask you a question that just came yeah. to me that is a little sidetrack and always uh, somehow always pulls back to my kids. My husband and I argue a lot about um, introducing adversity at a young age so that they learn to be more resilient from a young age. He's always pushing to introduce more adversity. And I'm sort of like, as they're growing foundationally, uh, my belief is you'll get things, you'll yeah. face adversity. Like it is coming no matter what, like yeah. as, no matter what you do and how safe you feel, you're going to face lots of challenges. Everybody does. Life is full of them. So Maybe. do you intentionally introduce adversity to them as youth, as young kids so that they uh, sort of hone their skill then? Or do you provide them with a safe foundation as much as you can to allow them to be strong individuals and feel safe in their own skin to then yeah. be able to be resilient as challenges come on? This is um, such a representation of the beautiful balance of masculinity and femininity. And by that, I mean, literally the divine masculine, the divine feminine, meaning that wow. the highest representation of femininity, the highest representation of masculinity, not the toxic limited version. And what I mean by that is like divine femininity or the highest frequency of that is a nurturing energy. It is a, you know, it is a um, very loving, supportive, nurturing, come here, big hug, like get in here. I will hold you and nurture your growth energy Ooh, that is the divine, I'm the divine feminine yeah yes. and the divine masculine is a destruction for creation energy it is a like it is a hard energy it's a hard charging energy it is an energy of like in hinduism the masculine energy is the destruction energy it is the thing that breaks things down so that they can be rebuilt in a better fashion oh, and okay. we need that too because okay you know we need to <laughs> sound so um, awful well, why? But that's how things change is by destroying yeah. and recreating. And so I actually think that example of you and Corey and TJ and I have the same exact dynamic is yeah. actually a representation of the balance between the feminine and the masculine actually making these children what they need to be, which is a very nurturing energy and an energy that's a little bit more hard charging and that right. is about kind of creating with grit what is the next chapter or the next future. And I think that kids need both. I think yeah. that if you're in a situation right. where you're overly only nurtured, right. you see this yeah. with a lot of boys of single moms, um, me being guilty of it too with my little one, where they can become overindulged and enabled and, um, you know, start to go out into the world with the sense that whatever they want is the way it should be. And holy shit, it's not like that. Now, all of a sudden, this is really overwhelming for me. So too much of that isn't good. Then if there's this absence of the nurturing self, and there's just this, you know, really yeah. hard charging, you know, go out there and have grit self, yeah. then you're missing the part of, of the love and the nurturing. So I think it's a really beautiful balance that oh. and it doesn't have to be by the way, I just want to be very clear. I'm not talking about gender. I'm not saying there's got to be a say, male yeah. parent and a female parent. I'm saying it's the just energy. that these two roles, these two energies are present of nurturing and um, really pushing people to the, the, the their highest in yeah. a way that is a little bit more like I'm going to toss you out of the nest kind of yeah. vibe. And I do think that creates resilience. I agree with him. Shut your mouth. Sorry. Who's best friend, are you? Sometimes I'm Corey's best friend. If it's okay, fine. Being true. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I think that, you know, I, I, 
pretty much said what I want to say about this, but I do just want to say that, um, you know, if we begin to look at adversity as an opportunity to become more of ourselves, yes, to shed all of the belief systems, the habits, the behaviors that have caused us to contract or suffer. If we look at adversity as a grindstone that's really trying to polish us into the beautiful prismatic gems we are, right. if we look at it that way, that is a massive tool of resilience. Because when there is purpose in anything, we can better tolerate it. When we understand the why of something, it's more tolerable. So looking at adversity spiritually through that lens of, okay, my soul has chosen this adversity for some level of spiritual growth, some right. level of expansion. How can I then um, continue to work through it, like survive through it? And look at it as where am I growing here? Which is so hard when you're suffering. It's so hard. It's really Guys, hard. This isn't coming from someone who's had an easy life. I just no. want to make, make that really clear. I get it. I've been there. Um, I live there still sometimes. But I really think that that is what spiritual masters and teachers have been telling us from the beginning of time. Yeah, like right. if you ever look at the teachings of the Buddha, if you ever look at even like if you look at just the teachings of Jesus beyond Christianity. Yeah. If you look at, you know, just spiritual masters who talk about these things, they talk about this being a part of the hero's journey, the spirit's journey of growth, that adversity is, is this moment, this opportunity of expansion, that if you believe that, not only do you make it through, but you come out of it more aligned to your highest frequency, which is the freaking best reward totally. there is. It is really hard when you're in it. And sometimes when you're in it, you're like, that's just bullshit that we say that we grow from this. I know. You know what I, I mean? Know. How often that it. happens. But, but you, you do always end grow. up always growing. Give me you, examples. Give me examples of you your life. You grow by the way, if you choose to engage in the process in that way. Agreed. Or it will if, suck you down. Totally. If your perspective is, well, the world is trying to kill me and I am going to let it, then it will. It will crush you. And no judgment, because um, sometimes you do feel so weak at the do. end of after all of it that you're like, just take me, <laughs> just crush totally. me, if you will. I can't fight anymore. Which is why we need to be there for each other. <laughs> I'm here for you. I agree. <laughs> Community. <laughs> but okay. truly. Um, so give me some me? personal stuff. I asked you, you were personal saying, stuff? trust me, I've oh, been through it. I mean, Bean, where do I start? I know. I, I know. I was like, uh, do I have to ask her? And I feel like we've talked about it a lot, but like bang it out in a list list for a list um being a child of an immigrant family in a state like colorado where there were no other people of color not just colorado by the way keystone colorado so i'm not talking a city i'm talking a mountain town um where there are no other persian people there are no other people of color around um watching this immigrant family then struggle to survive um then, you know, having my parents be in a marriage that was not healthy and watching my mother really, really try and make it work while having her heart broken and her soul shattered repeatedly over and over again. Um, leaving that marriage and moving across the country and being raised by a mother who had to figure out how to, on a seamstress's salary, change her whole life around and pay for a new home that we had to live in and, you know, food and everything that goes into survival, you know, watching her resilience allow her to go from a seamstress to a technical writer for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, like a good government office job that took care of us. I'm Coming out of her. that. I'm so proud of her. Yeah, proud of her. Mean, yeah, she really is resilient, truly. Yeah, but like the, the struggle of how are we going to afford groceries, the struggle of, you know, going to school and not having the brand names on, the struggle of the socioeconomic stuff that happens when you have the shame of being a lower socioeconomic class than your friends and shit, you don't want them to come to your house. You'd rather go to their house. Like all of yeah. that is a struggle. Then the, you know, leaving that and the first marriage that I was in and all the limiting belief systems I brought from my upbringing into being married to someone who had mental health struggles that he had to address that he did not 
and having children with that kind of, you know, of, I don't want to say he's a good person, but with someone who's struggling like that right, um, is definitely, I think my greatest moment of adversity is two babies um, yeah. on my own, really. Like, and having a partner who was not able to be a partner and not able to even create safety, created situations that were unsafe, deeply unsafe emotionally. And um, really feeling in that moment, like, oh my God, uh, we might not make it through this. Like, and then also the mama bear in me being like, fuck that. Like, we're yeah. not only going to make it through this. These two kids are going to have the best fucking life I can make happen. And like you finding, like reaching in to find resilience when there was nothing. Nothing. Like there was nothing to grab at. I don't know why I'm getting emotional. It's been so long. I do. What do you mean? Because it was yeah. really the hardest time of your life. And it was really hard. And you still think about it. That's why. And now I'm getting emotional watching you get emotional. <laughs> Yeah. So that's why I say to people all the time, like, I'm not sitting here with some um, super privileged, right, uh, privileged life that everything was easy telling you that adversity is growth. I'm telling you because I like lived in that fire and shit burnt down to for the a ground long time. For, yeah, a long for a long time. time. And it was like, oh my God, we're not going to survive. And then being like, no, 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 we got this. Like finding resilience. And you know, I always say this, like people who meet me now, this Maury, who's in this career and this marriage and this life, and then they meet my ex, they're always like, what? Like, we can't even put it together. And I say to them, it's because it's not, it's only because you're meeting a different version of me. Correct. I am a way more empowered version of myself who you are meeting. And then you can't imagine that I would have been able to be in partnership like this. But that growth into this empowered me only came from being in that damn grindstone for so long I thought it was going to crush me into nothing for those who don't know also Maury and I have been friends since we became very close oh, right before she got married to him and we were all very close my husband and her ex-husband and so yeah. it wasn't like even though they meet them I, I was there and I was like and Maury was still so powerful to me but it it's it just made more sense. I don't know. I can't even explain it now thinking of who you are now. And you weren't weak then. I don't even know where I'm going with this. But I'm just, different. You definitely are different for sure. Yeah. And so am I. It's crazy. It's right. wild. Life's and, a wild ride. And it, it would have never happened without the adversity. Correct. And I would never be here living my purpose and without teaching it. the teachings that I do and healing people and guiding them to their most expanded highest self. Had I not walked this path, I had I to walk it. So I, I also tell people this all the time. Your adversity is a big clue about your purpose because you are never asked to walk a path without then doing something valuable with it. Hmm. Interesting. So what you are going through, other people are going through. And how you navigate it will be an inspiration. And it is part of your purpose. And the way you left your marriage was you heard your higher self one day say, it's yes. time. Yes. And then you listen. And after that, it was like, okay, I heard her loud and clear. And yeah. I'm going to keep listening. And it, But that whole experience was the only way to get you to that moment. That's right. Yeah. That's my story as we're crying. Um, okay. At least you have so tissues. I have to use my hands. <laughs> To offset this deeply yeah. emotional moment, why don't we talk a little bit about science? Because there has been Please. a lot of effort put into looking at resilience. Again, because I think that we as a species are so fucking resilient right. that, you know, we're fascinated by this concept of resilience and how yeah. it works. So I thought I would share a little bit about like how researchers and scientists have looked at just resilience in us as humans. Um, and, you know, hopefully it's enlightening, but couple of things that I thought was important. So there's a theory actually called the resilience theory. Um, and basically what it says is that it's, you know, saying that individuals can adapt well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats. Um, and it emphasizes that the dynamic interaction between personal traits and environmental factors are what allow 
greater or lessened resilience. So what that means is that um, they looked at children who were in high risk environments, right? And they looked at who displayed what they call a positive adaptation and why. Right. And what they learned is that um, so much of what was allowing these children to be resilient was a combination of their personality traits and the environment around them. Nature so this argument nurture. of nature versus nurture, that resilience is this amalgamation, this, this composite of nature and nurture, your personality traits and the environment in which you um, grow. So this continues to be studied. There's this other study that then builds off of that, that talks about um, the developmental assets framework. And what this means, it's, um, it was developed by the Search Institute. But basically this, fr this framework identifies really specific external and internal assets that contribute to resilience in youth. So right. external assets, meaning things like support from your family and your community environment, and then internal assets, which are things like your values, the things that come, the skills that come to you really naturally, the things you're passionate or committed to as, as an individual. And what the key findings were is that the presence of the, these developmental assets increases the likelihood of higher resilience and better mental health. Meaning that if the environment, the external assets are that of support, right. family, community, friends, and the internal assets, the values, the, the skills are aligned to, you know, that you feel like um, buoyed, but you feel grounded in your value. You feel, you, you know, your ass, you know, your assets, you know, your skills, you have as a, a child. Are we talking about this as still as children? Yeah, as you, they, they say youth, so I'm not thinking it's very young kids, but right. this idea that like they are aware, they are aware okay. of their skill sets, of their values, of the things okay. they want to do. This is what I want to do with my life. And there's been a supportive environment. There's a higher resilience quotient in these people when there's the combination of those two factors present. God, you look confused. No, I'm just, I am. Is this part of the talk? I was just trying to think of my own childhood. Every time you're saying oh. things, I keep thinking back to my own childhood and like experiences and how it all line adds up. Yeah. And I think I can understand some things. Oh, good. Enlightenment is happening. Um, there is this, um, there is this psychologist, Martin Sel Sel Seligman. Let's do that again. Right. There is this psychologist, Martin Seligman. They call um, him a pioneer in positive psychology. And he talks about the importance of character strengths and optimism as a part of resilience. And so his work really indicated that fostering positive emo emotions and strengths can help individuals cope with stress and recover from setbacks more efficiently, effectively. So for parents out there, the takeaway for me from this was really modeling optimism and teaching yeah. optimism and being, remember I said, was it this episode or the last one? Your perspective is your reality. So when you see the world with optimism, you're more likely to display resilience in the face of adversity than when you see the world in a pessimistic way. I find optimism for me, what I've witnessed to be more um, nature though than nurture. I think they, they factor, I think of mm. course it's some combo of both, but I yeah. really do believe even like witnessing um, siblings who are totally different in terms yeah. of their perspective. It's like just kind of something you're born with or you're not. Yeah. <laughs> so I good luck that. guys. I think it is nurture. I, I was very nurtured to be optimistic. And I actually think that my internal self can be really pessimistic. Like I think that I have a um, highly critical eye and a yeah. lot of anxiety. And so those things can cause me to go into a negative mindset. Right. And it's all of that nurture from my mom and my grandmother that was like gratitude. You know, you're, great, you're grateful, you're grateful, you're healthy, you're breathing, you're, that like has allowed me to be optimistic. Wow. That's awesome. The way I see it. Yeah. Um, 
There's a stress resilience connection. There's a study by Tugod and Fredrickson in 2004 that showed how resilience is associated with the ability to experience positive emotions, even in stressful situations. Um, And so the findings are participants who reported higher resilience demonstrated a greater capacity to use positive emotional experiences as a source of strength thereby aiding recovery from stress. So really playing on past positive emotional experiences and bringing them to mind during times of of adversity allows greater resilience, which I have found to be true in my life. And I use this as a coaching tool. I always ask people who are in adversity to, to think back to a last moment of adversity. And how did that work out? Or how did you come out on the other end? Yeah. Like what is the evidence here? Yeah. Or when you're feeling this, you know, if adversity includes this sense of isolation or lack of support, okay, where are areas in your life where you do have support? Where is there love coming at you that you're not paying attention to? And drawing the mind back to those positive experiences to help create this foundation of um, awareness that there is, there is this support, there is this positive outcome, I can remember it. And therefore that reminder acts as a life raft in times of adversity. Because adversity, you can, during adversity in particular, you can be so tunnel vision focused on the the shittiness. You can't even see the beauty around you. Right. Great tip. Yeah. So this study basically says, bring your mind to the positive memories that does add to resilience. Not even memories. Bring your mind to something positive currently going on, like you were just saying. You know what I mean? If you're feeling unsupported in one way, look look around you and see where you are supported. Yeah, exactly. And that actually takes me to the last study I was going to bring up. And I think the last thing we need to really touch on is um, yeah. there's this protective factor framework. And basically what it says is that um, – This approach identifies protective factors that enhance resilience. And what they found is that social support is the greatest one. I was reading that too. I love um, that. Studies, these studies have shown that higher levels of social support um, can effectively reduce the negative impacts of adversity. So community is so important in this conversation of resilience because we are a social species. We rely on one another and we need each other and And adversity can feel so isolating often and i even me when i'm in like the depths of despair about whatever's happening i feel less in the mood to socialize and less in the mood to call a friend to vent but i think it's those moments where you need to sometimes not always sometimes you need the space and the rest but sometimes to reach out to somebody you wouldn't really normally reach out just to see where it takes you. Absolutely. And I also think sometimes it requires you to go seek people who are going through similar experiences. This is where grief groups, right? Or even think about AA. AA has been so successful for decades and decades and decades. Right. Because what they have understood is, among other things, um, when we are together, when we are navigating something challenging together, there is a sense of belonging and support and feeling seen and understood in that specific community. So I will say sometimes your friend group is not going to be the group that can support you the best when you're going through a particular kind of adversity. When I was getting divorced, I noticed that I felt more seen around friends who had been divorced because they understood at a cellular level Right. The things that I was going through that my married friends couldn't, for example. So it's also totally. about seeking community that is also going through or has gone through that experience so that you can feel really held. Yeah, that's really, there's something very lovely and beautiful about this aspect of resilience. Yeah, we need each other. Punchline. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, and We totally. need each other. Like we totally. keep thinking that we're going to go at it alone and we can't. We need yeah. each other. We are a... um interconnected species. And like, would you want your friend to be suffering alone? Would you want your children to be suffering in silence? No, you would want them to have the support that they need. So you too should seek that. Yeah. And I think that like the way you can do that as an individual is that when you sense intuitively someone is having a hard day, just look them in the eye. 
How are you? Yeah. Everything good? Just yeah. ask. Like, stop. Yeah. Take don't do the meeting. Don't do the whatever the hell. Don't fast forward past it. Connect. That's support. That's community yeah. right there. And that Agreed. will like, contribute to their resilience. And they'll remember that. I remember the people who just stopped and like were there for me during that time. I always I will. Yeah. I don't think I was enough and it makes me of sad course. and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so... <laughs> on that note on that note I feel like that's super uplifting no I think there it is really uplifting and I was my want want was about me reflecting on your time during the height of your divorce and not feeling like I provided but like you said it was also harder with your married friends who to connect with you in that way um yeah I still wish I had done more anyway we had a weird dynamic in that the four of us were best friends though and so Corey was navigating his own heartbreak around it like it was complicated. It doesn't matter. It was complicated, but you're still my best friend. And I, I love you and I wish I supported you. I always moment. feel I always feel that. Um anyway, so let's move along. Um let's talk about people and I keep going back to my grandmother. I've yeah, mentioned you, her you a were million times. Up, Bobby, you I need to. I always think of her when I think of resilience. I mean, she is so wonderful and she enjoys everything, but like she's been through plenty of stuff. First of all, she was born in like the thirties. I mean, she has seen yes. some shit. Yes. They went through two bankruptcies that they recovered from. Right. They went through, my grandfather was an alcoholic and went into a program. I mean, right. she's been through it, but she yeah. just somehow is so freaking positive. It's really wild and resilient at that. So yes. some key traits that I looked up, um, that pretty much a lot of them apply to my grandmother, but not all. Um, prob- good problem solving skills, but oh, you wouldn't yeah. really think That's about. Yeah, yeah, it is a good point because in Ill- able to be resilient, you have to think of your way out, or yeah. you have to think of the way to fight whatever is consuming you. Yeah, um, which often involves problem solving. That's a really good point. I know. Um, I oh, I, I feel kind of feel like. Now that you say that, I'm like, oh, maybe that's why I'm the most resilient is that I'm a solutions person. I'm a solutions person, but I struggle with, I love the idea of having a solution, but I struggle with getting there. Implementing it. Implementing, which is why I think I I can be resilient in some times and in other times I just crumble. Sure. Yeah. Um, strong social connections, which you mentioned, which has to be one of my favorite takeaways from this whole thing that I learned was that resilient people... It, they're surrounded by a good support group. Like how yeah. lovely and beautiful and how almost obvious is that when well, you feel you know supported? It it's yeah. also a form of reparenting because we talked about how nurture, like in the studies where people were in environments where they were nurtured are more right. resilient. Lots of people didn't have that. And right. there is nothing stopping you from creating it now. Like oh, creating the kind of support system that you didn't have as a child so that you can become more resilient is absolutely something you can now do. And creating that in itself is an act of resilience. Absolutely. Is saying, I faced yeah. this, but here's a way to fix it and get right. out of it. Right. Um, survivor mentality. So I guess not constantly, weren't we going to do a victim episode? Um, not constantly thinking like, oh, why me? Why me? Why me? Like, right. F- focusing on, I'm going to get through this. I've gotten through things in the past. I can keep going. I don't have a choice often. Um, I think that what I said about the spiritual value of adversity helps to fight that victim mentality. Because when you see the adversity as productive to your growth, right. that is the answer to why me. Why yeah. you? Because you're being called to be better, to be more you, to yeah. grow, to be more expanded. That is why you. And if you can't find it, which can be really challenging, pick something small. Pick one yeah, little thing that you can small. shift that yeah. in this whole ball of shit storm that's happening, right. find one part of it that you're like, you know what? I- I'm going to shift this because of it. Yeah. Um, emotional regulation, really strong emotional regulation skills. That's another reason why I think there's not a ton of resilience is I think the majority of adults I know do not have any form of emotional regulation or yeah. self-awareness, which was to call back to our last episode. Um, not having not having self-awareness leads to a lack of emotional regulation because you're just not informed about how you respond to things. In my and I ask my clients and myself 
to always know that an immediate response is very rarely um, necessary to anything. Right. So if you notice yourself getting agitated, aggravated, uncomfortable, upset, sad, whatever, take a deep breath, say, I'll get back to you. Like take the space to feel your feelings, let them wave and pass and move through you, achieve that level of centered self, and then come back to the person or the solution. I had a healer once tell me in Bali, you know, the thing you need to learn is that the solution is never in the worry. And I was like, oh, you're damn right. Like what I'm doing when I am worrying is trying to solve it. What if I just, when I'm worrying was say to say to myself, well, you ain't going to solve it here. So don't try. So when you're in a different head state, you can attempt it. So I think that emotional regulation is about taking pause and breathing and like really feeling your feelings and then centering yourself and then coming back to the thing you're trying to deal it's with. almost like when your toddler's having a tantrum meltdown that's right. never the time to instill the lesson right you have to let them work through that moment yes. and get to a calmer space before they're even receptive i mean same, yes deal with Do yourself with yourself yeah yeah um and the last one was which is also another shout out to our last episode of uh self-reflection is self-compassion yes is if you're beating the shit out of yourself throughout the process of adversity Correct. um Rather than supporting so yourself trouble. and giving yourself some grace, you're only making it harder for yourself. That's it's it. It's so true. It's yeah. so true. You know, one of the things I did, you said that I like really heard my higher self during times of adversity. I also visualized her and I visualized who I wanted to be. Like, what is it that I know I have in me that if I really fed it and nurtured it, and it grew into the best version of myself. What does she look like? What is she doing? What kind of life does she live? And it allowed me to be so compassionate to myself in the moment when the adversity was happening because I had this vision of myself that was so positive and glowing that I was aiming towards. Oh, it makes me think of this line from this very random Jennifer Aniston movie from the early 90s called Picture Perfect. And her boss says to her, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Which is kind of a more superficial way of saying like envision greater, envision yeah. great, envision getting out of this, envision being on the other side of this. And when you see yourself that way, you will have more compassion for yourself. Agreed. Yeah. Wow, Bean. I wow. really feel like this episode is full of your favorite full. TTs, tangible Chalk takeaway full. Tool. And I wanted I want a couple uh techniques. Um, okay. What you gave them? I gave them throughout. All right. So Josie, best friend Josie, cut that out. Josie, cut that out. Josie, um, we're not going so to go to that part. I think this is full of your favorite tangible takeaway tools. So 100%. But it be an unless we had Melissa's famous takeaways. So, Bean, take us away. Oh my gosh. I feel like I grew. I feel like I faced adversity in this episode <laughs> and I grew from it on the other side. Um, I think a lot of it is don't. I mean, I guess that's the definition of resilience, though, is just don't succumb to adversity as hard as it is. Use positive thinking as much as you can. Grasp onto small things. It doesn't have you don't have to expect everything to miraculously be better on the other side of it. But pick and choose. You used to always say to me, like when anything shitty would happen to me, like even in our 20s, you would say to me, what did you what can you take away from this? What did you learn from this? Mm -hmm. And if it was even something small, like whatever. Don't, I don't know. Um, any little bit you can get out of there. I think that reminds you of growth allows you to see the situation differently and plow forward, even as hard as it is during it. I know I've been in the depths of despair myself and I know that it can feel like an elephant on your chest and like, there's no moving forward, but life is full of that. So there's, you always move forward because you face more adversity. So you must've moved through the other one. Yeah. And rely on each other. Support, support. That was my, actually, you're right. That was my biggest takeaway is how vital your support system can be. And I do feel like I have a lot of really great friends being included um, that I can rely on. Um, And I do feel like in my late, in my older years now, I do feel much more resilient than I ever felt 
yeah. now that I recognize, you know, the strength of people around me and I recognize things about myself, I'm able to be more resilient, which is another thing is the more adversity you face, the stronger you become. It's so yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Bean. Bean. I love that you. Was lovely. What a good reminder of having each other to lean on and Absolutely. how we've been resilient because of each other too. So I love you. And guys, thank you. you for listening. We love you. Um, as always, share this with anyone that you love and come back next week for another episode. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.